So Brother Booker called me about a month ago and asked me to teach, and he gave me a whole list of different things that I could teach on. He actually let me come up with a list of different things that I could teach on today. And um, he said, he said, just come up with something that you're passionate about with, with these kids. And I started thinking to myself, and I already said, I'm a youth leader. I'm not even a Sunday school teacher. So uh, like when it comes to puppets and, and things like that, I'm sure there's going to be some awesome teaching going on during this seminar. But, but one thing that I told him is that the biggest thing for me as a youth leader is their transition from the Sunday school age to youth leadership and eventually to the adult church, right? Um, I've seen it way too many times that people come into my class, and I'm, I actually teach everything from freshmen in high school up to the age of 25 being unmarried. So I cover a pretty wide span, and there's nothing that's more aggravating to me. And, and our, our Sunday school teachers are awesome. They're getting a lot better at discipling their children. But when they get to me, they're going to need to learn about you know, identity as far as gender goes. They're going to need to learn about overcoming sin. They're going to need to learn about getting through temptation that they're going to face in high school. And a lot of times these kids come to me and they don't know, you know the books of the Bible. And they don't know, uh, they, they can't tell you scriptures for, for the plan of salvation and things like this. And, and so what I'm going to be teaching on is actually, is actually more like a transition period. It, it's how to get them through that stage of, of just being, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this uh, to be ugly or anything, but through the stage of just being kids to being saints, to being people that are really going to push and promote the revival of your church. And so the first thing that I want to I want to bring up to teach us about child discipleship is what discipleship is not. A lot of times when people think of discipleship, they think of it as just getting your kids to believe certain things of the scripture. A lot of times when we're talking about the stories in the Bible, Jonah and the well, Noah's ark, uh, the three Hebrew children, we focus so much on getting them to believe these scriptures because they're they're just to, to the carnal mind, they're difficult to believe, right? But if we're really going to be disciples, we have to take it past them just believing these stories, and we have to show them applications in their own lives for these stories. It's, it's not a matter of just once upon a time and then ending it with, and they lived happily ever after. You're not teaching them stories when you teach them your Sunday school stories, but you're teaching them things that children of God actually had to go through. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego isn't a fairy tale. This is something that these children had to go through. And, and the, the reason it's in the Bible is not just so that we would believe their story, but it's so that we can take their story and apply it to our own lives. Amen. Amen. And um, I, don't, I don't think I printed out enough, but if I give you guys papers, um, until I start getting into the actual steps, because I have five steps for child discipleship, until I start getting the steps, maybe write your notes on the back of the paper, because just in case you need the, the space to write those notes uh, in, on those lines. So, child discipleship, though, it's not just about them getting to getting them to believe stories. But the Bible says in John chapter 8, uh, verses 31 and 32, it said, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, but then he said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. We're trying to make disciples out of these children. It's, it's not just a little kid that we have to wipe some snot off his nose every once in a while. But we're trying to make them followers of Christ. Right. It's more than just teaching them the apostolic doctrine, and that's very important. It's more than just teaching them the Pentecostal experience, and that's super important. But we've got to teach these kids how to be Christian. Right. We've, we've, got to, we've got to really disciple these kids and teach them how to be followers of Christ. And so he said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples. You, you've already believed on me, but you've got to take it a step past that and apply it in your everyday life. Uh, and then he goes on to say, um, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. A lot of times we look at that scripture and we're, we're thinking that it's talking about, you know, the drug addict. The truth will set the drug addict free, and the truth will set the alcoholic free, and the truth will set the pervert free. But that's not what it's talking about in context here. It says, you are my disciples, and the truth shall set you free. And so when we teach these kids 
we might not be trying to deliver them out of the depths of sin that some adults are in, but we're still trying to set them free out of their own insecurities and out of their own mindset. And a lot of times out of their own um, inability to act for the kingdom of God. We're trying to set these guys free. We're, we're trying to break those chains of indecision off of them. We're, we're trying to push them to a, a further step and a further purpose in the kingdom of God. Amen. Well, turn around, iPad. There. Another thing that discipleship is not is getting them from bus kids to being active saints. And a lot of people say that when you disciple children, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get them from the Sunday school class to the big church. And, and that has a part to play. You're trying to get them to be, you know, God-fearing adults and all this. But it's easy to keep them in the pews. And it's even easy to let them learn an instrument and be on the platform. But it has to be more than then just becoming active saints in the temple of God. It's about making them from bus kids to active soldiers in the army of the Lord. It's, it's more than about their actions in church on Sunday and whenever your midweek service is. That's, that's discipleship 101. But what did he say? He said, if you're going to be my disciples, you're going to have to continue. You're going to have to go further than just the basics. In order to disciple these kids, we don't only teach them how to have church on Sunday, but we teach them how to overcome temptation on Monday. Right. And we don't only teach them you know, how, how to be there early for pre-service prayer during midweek service on Wednesday or Thursday or whenever your midweek is. But we've got to teach them how to live every day in their life and, and to, to build a prayer closet in their own home, to have a prayer walk in their own lives. This is what discipleship really is. And so I've kind of broken down, um, before I get there, the question of discipleship is not whether or not there will be a church. Uh, a lot of people, they say, if you don't disciple the Sunday school kids, then later on your church is just going to go to nothing and it's not going to exist but and, and it does have something to do with that a lot of people say that the Sunday school kids of today are the church for tomorrow but I believe that the Sunday school kids of today are the church for today they might be the leadership of the church of tomorrow but they're souls just as much as you and I are souls right um, I, I don't like the idea of saying that Sunday we're trying to teach Sunday school kids to become saints because what is a saint? A saint is just a part of the church. These kids have souls. If God were to come back today, they would go to either heaven or hell. They have an everlasting, eternal part of their being. And so we've got to treat them like such. It's, it's more than just getting them to where they don't backslide when they become teenagers. It, it's more than that. Um, the Bible says in Matthew <laughs> chapter 16, verses 18 and 19, I believe, Matthew chapter 16 verses 18 to 19 very familiar set of scripture it says and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven no verse 18 and I say unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock and this is Jesus speaking he said upon this rock I will build my church so God has a part to play in the building of the church God has a job to do in the existence of the church. And then he says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell is likened unto death. And so in other words, the church will never be utterly destroyed. It will always exist somewhere. So the question for discipling your Sunday school children is not the question as to whether or not the church will exist in the future. But then after he said upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's God's job. Then he gave Peter a job. And when he gave Peter a job, Peter is kind of like the face of the New Testament church. Peter represents us when it comes to Peter's ministry. And so he said, uh, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then he turned to Peter and he said, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So the question concerning child discipleship is not whether or not the church will exist in the future. But it's how victorious will the church be? And how powerful will the church be? Are you going to be experiencing miracles and signs and wonders in the future? If you don't disciple them when they're kids, <coughs> you might not. It's whether or not the church is loosed to do the work of God or bound. That's the question with discipleship. 
are are these kids going to be growing up in the prayer rooms or are they going to be growing up on the basketball courts are these kids going to be growing up because they're they're going to be pew warmers right but we have to teach them to be more than that we have to teach them to be warriors for the army of christ amen a lot of a lot of churches today that aren't experiencing revival aren't experiencing revival in their adult sessions because they didn't teach them how to be disciples because they didn't teach them how to be more than just believers when they were kids amen so i love this seminar because every time we come to this seminar we bring uh unfortunately we weren't able to bring a whole lot of people from our uh, sunday school program in lake isabella this year but usually when we come we have somebody in every single session taking notes and, and really listening and i love it because because Every time we leave here, we say we leave with a burden, saying we've got to do something now. There, there's an immediate attention in our hearts when we leave this place. And if I want to portray anything to you guys today, I want to portray to you that there's no time to waste because there's potential in the balance. The church, 20 years down the road, is going to exist, whether it's with the Sunday school kids in our class or not. It'll be there. But the problem is, is I want it to be with the Sunday school kids in my class. And I want the Sunday school kids in my class to be praying people through to the Holy Ghost. And I want them to be giving Bible studies. And the sooner we start discipling them, the sooner we start teaching them these five steps that I'm going to be going over uh, with us very soon, the better it will be. The more experience, the more potential they'll have in their walks with God. Amen. Uh, 1 Samuel. Chapter 17, verses 32 through 39 is kind of the template that I took these five steps of child discipleship. It's, we all know the story of David and Goliath, right? <laughs> Being Sunday school teachers, you better know that story. But um, uh, there, was, there was a discussion that went on between Saul, King Saul and the shepherd boy David that we often overlook. The, the discussion that went on between Saul and David when, when Saul finally gave David the go-ahead to go out and defeat Goliath. And that's the discussion that I kind of draw my template from for the five steps of children discipleship. Did we have any of those left over? Okay, so I'll just have to remember. Amen. Uh, but 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 32 through 39 is where I find this. And I'll just read it at face value at first. It says, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, he, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth, and when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing as he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the paw of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor. And he put his, an helmet of brass upon his head, and uh, also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. So there's five steps to discipleship that I find in this commentary between Saul and David. And a lot of times when we look at this passage of Scripture, we see that Saul is kind of trying to discourage David from going out to battle against Goliath, right? And so his motives were wrong, because his motives to his follower, to this young man in his life that was willing to fight a victory for the king, his motives were off, because he was trying to, to discourage him from going to battle. But I believe that the message that Saul had during this commentary was right. There was a great victory route that day, right? The head of Goliath ended up being off. And even though Saul said all the things that he said with the wrong motives, if we can take the message that Saul has in this portion of Scripture and put a positive spin on it, and, and put, put 
a spin on it that is encouraging them instead of discouraging them from the ways of God. Then I believe that God will do great things in our Sunday school programs. So the first thing that we have to realize in this portion is that two times in these seven scriptures, David referred to Saul as thy servant. Thy servant did this. Thy servant did that. And thy servant will be able to do these things. Right? And so the first thing that we have to realize, and this is step one in discipleship, and I'll just read it right off your paper. It's live the example of discipline. Discipleship is actually not something that you teach. Because discipleship is becoming a disciple of Christ. That's something that you become. What you teach in discipleship is discipline. You teach how to pray. You teach how to fast. You teach how to walk with God every day of your life. Right? So when we say child discipleship, what we're actually teaching these children is discipline concerning the things of God. But the first step that we have to understand with child discipleship is that you have to live the example. If you want your children to pray, you've got to be prayers. That's right. If you want your children to read their Bibles, let them see you read your Bible. Uh, if you want to teach your children against sin, you be repentant in your own heart. If you want to teach your children even the five steps of salvation, thank you. Even if you want to teach your children the steps of salvation, right? Make sure that they see you renewing your own salvation. You can't teach them that you'll get the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues if they never see you up at the altar with your hands raised speaking in tongues. You can't teach them that they have to live a holy life if they see you in the, the mall on Tuesday and, and you're, you're living subpar to the pastor's standards for your life. The first step in every discipleship program <laughs> is to live the life of discipline. Amen. You can't expect more from them than you put on yourself. Even if you just want them to learn an instrument so that they can be used on the platform later on in life. You learn the instrument. And you don't have to be perfect at it. Um, there's, there's something kind of funny. My mom wanted me to learn the guitar so that I could start playing it in our church. And I, I went to three different teachers. My first teacher was like 90 years old. He, he was about to die, I'm sure of it. But um, he was 90 years old, and he was the most boring teacher I have ever seen in my life. So that was one teacher that I found in the world, all right? The second teacher that I went to was this little Vietnamese guy that, that probably came up to my waist even at the time when I was like 13 years old. No, I'm just kidding. But, but he was just this little guy, and he had a hot attitude. He had a bad temper. And if, if I didn't practice for a week, he would literally cuss me out as a 13-year-old. So my mom pulled me away from him, right? And then she finally got me a good teacher who, had, who I actually had a lot of fun with to teach me how to play the guitar. But the problem with him is he was a smoker. And he didn't respect me at all in, in, that, in that scenario. He, he taught me how to play the guitar fairly well. Um, but the problem was is he would smoke and he would blow it in my face while he was teaching me how to play the guitar. And so, if you're not living the life of this discipline, who are your children going to, to learn? If you teach your kid, you know, you've got to pray, and they don't see you praying, they're going to go to somebody who does pray to get that example. If, if you teach your kid that you've got to practice what you preach, amen, that's the first step of child discipleship. You realize that David kept saying to Saul, thy servant, because he had respect for Saul. Because Saul lived the life of example. And it doesn't mean that you have to be perfect in an area. My brother Tyler, who's teaching one of the classes uh, today, he plays the drums a little bit. And he's not the greatest drum player. I mean, he's, he's very good. But I know several people that are better than him. But a young man in our church, a Sunday school age kid in our church, went up to Tyler one day and said, Tyler, can you teach me how to play the drums? Tyler's not perfect at the drums, but because he lived the example, he made an impact on the Sunday school age children. And that's one of the most beautiful things that I think about Sunday school, is that you don't have to be perfect for it. They are very forgiving souls. Amen. So, so if you want your children to pray, pray. If you want your children to succeed in certain areas, you succeed in those areas and be their example. Amen. 
So we find, now in this, in this context of 1 Samuel chapter 17, David wasn't seven or eight years old. A lot of times we'll tell our Sunday school kids, he might have been your age in like a desperate attempt to connect to them, right? But in the chapter previous, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, the Bible calls David a mighty man of war. And so, and so I, don't, I don't think that he's seven or eight years old necessarily, but he was a young man because he was young enough for Saul to worry about him. And he was young enough for David or for Goliath to mock him when he got out to the battlefield saying, seriously, you sent me a young man, a, a child. And so, so he was young. He wasn't as young as a lot of times we say, but we have to understand that Saul, when Saul was faced with the Goliath in his life, See, Goliath didn't come to David. A lot of times we look at Goliath as David's victory. And in the, in the grand scheme of things, that was the case. But when Goliath came, he wasn't coming against David. He was coming against Israel. And he was coming against Saul, the, the, the face and, and the, the leader of Israel. That's who he was actually coming against. And so Goliath was Saul's battle. That should have been Saul out on the battlefield. Uh, with sword in hand, taking him on. But Saul faced something in his life that he couldn't overcome because of fear and because of doubt. And if we're ever able to disciple our children, they're going to be able to overcome trials that we can't even overcome. Because they have a level of faith and they have a level of innocence that can touch God. A lot of times when we see temptations and trials and things come against us, it scares us. Because we've seen how that problem has broken up families. And we've seen how that problem has, has caused churches not to have revival for year upon year upon year. But if we can teach our children how to face the Goliaths in our life, if we can teach these ones who haven't seen the breakup of the family and who haven't seen the, the inability to reach revival, then they're innocent and their faith is untainted by the world. And they're... They have a courage that if they can get a prayer life, and if we can get a study life, study how it's down into their heart, if we can get the life of a disciple, the life of a follower of Christ, and not just a believer in his way, but a life, the life of a disciple in their hearts, then they're going to bring great victory to our church. Amen. So the first thing we need to do is live the life of example. And then the first thing that Saul said, and this goes on to the second step. The first thing that Saul said to David was you are not able to go and fight with this Philistine. And again, Saul's method was wrong because he was trying to discourage David from going out and fighting against Goliath. But even though his motives were wrong, his message was right. When he said you are not able. Now, the second step, I believe it says stress the importance of being spiritually led these kids are fragile they've only been in this world five six seven eight nine ten years and the devil's been doing what he does for a long time that's right <clears throat> these kids can't over they can't <coughs> by themselves that's why we have to stress the importance of being spiritually led first john chapter four verse four i'll just quote it ye are of god little children and have overcome them why just because you're of god just because you go to church, just because your parents drag you kicking and screaming to Sunday school every Sunday morning? No, that's not why you've overcome. But it says you have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The second step to children discipleship is to stress the importance of being spiritually led. The sooner that they learn this step, the better. Amen. A lot of people say that they're just kids. How can you expect them to be so spiritual? But that kind of goes into the third step. The third step says, the third step says, get started as soon as possible so that they can have maximum power and potential. This is the third step. Because the next thing that Saul said to David in this conversation, he said, you're just a youth. You're not able to go fight up to fight against him because you're just a youth, and he's been a man of war from his youth. That goes to show me that the people in the world, the people outside of the children of God, are discipling their children to be the best they, they can be for their gods. 
we find that Kobe Bryant, the best basketball player of all time, some might say, <laughs> according to the stats, that's right. A lot of people say that Michael Jordan's better than him, but he's broken all, almost every one of Michael Jordan's records. So Kobe Bryant said at the age of three that he wanted to be a pro basketball player to his parents. And his parents made him live up to that standard. They discipled him. They taught him. They let him have an opportunity to learn how to be a basketball player. And he grew up to be a fantastic basketball player. Tiger Woods, probably the best golfer of all time. He had a golf club put in his hand at the age of two. And then by the age of three, he appeared on TV in a putting match against Bob Hope and beat him at the age of three years old. Michael Jackson started lead vocals with his brother in the Jackson 5 at the age of 8. They've been men of war from their youth. Why can't we teach our kids to be the best that they can be for our God? All right. Amen.